हेलो 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 ओके या नाउ इट वर्क्स एक्चुअली इट वाज़न मी वाज़न द टेक्नोलॉजी वेल uh welcome to our second lecture out of the series um that like kind of uh Joshua organized uh he's actually excusing himself because um apparently there was a tennis ball flying into his eye um so that's why i'm standing here to welcome our two guests um Jerry Ong and Lawrence Sujen um so why well at the last week we had like kind of two small firms um i hope you all were kind of here to actually kind of um listen to their kind of small stories about how they actually run kind of their their one small firms with maybe maybe up to 10 or 15 employees uh so today we actually have like um two representatives of two of the largest firms in the kind of Singapore we have um uh Jerry Ong from CPG Consultation um, Corporation and Lawrence Lair from RSP Architects and i just want to read out the abstract that um Joshua actually prepared for us because i think he wrote it actually quite well by convention, the architect emerges by taking leave over large practices, by starting a new one, small office with a clearly defined identity. However, many young architects in Singapore are taking alternative route, that of the emerging architect in the large practice. Is this the rise of a new type of celebrated architect? Is the large firm a viable place to establish a personal identity? What are the advantages created by this type of career path? perhaps on the established industry capability of larger practices. For this session, architect Jerry Ong from CPG Corporation and Lawrence Jair, Lair from RSP will share highlights of their own careers, as well as their thoughts on the contribution of Singapore's larger offices to the professional and the built environment. Um, so we'll actually begin with uh, Jerry Ong. Uh, since joining CPG Consultants in 2003, Jerry has been involved in an array of projects comprising healthcare facilities, commercial and residential buildings, institutions, as well as sport and fa park facilities. Most recently, Kotek Port Hospital won in the categories of the Community and Culture Project Award and Sustainability Project Award in the 2014 Cityscape Awards for Emerging Markets. And this was one of the hospitals I went to, uh, not as a patient, but as a visitor. And I must uh, say this is actually one of the most enjoyable hospitals um, one could actually imagine to be in, right? Just, um, even though it was actually nicer just to go there on a visit than uh, staying there. Jerry has gained invaluable experiences from his involvement across a wide range of project and has displayed his versatility as an architect and a designer. So let's welcome him and like kind of raise our hands. You really have to. Hello. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Hello. Good evening. I think I see a familiar face. Hi, Chien. <laughs> Anybody else I am supposed to know? <laughs> okay. Um, I'm Jerry, okay, from CPG Consultants. So I understand today it was deliberately paired, you know, between me and Lawrence because actually we are from the same batch. And coincidentally, we are working in big companies. Okay, so I'm not sure how many of you are here because you are interested to know about the experience in a big company or just because you happen to be free? So, how many of you are interested about hearing from us about our experience working in a big company? Most, most of you. Okay, so anyway, uh, without any further ado, I think I will just uh, go very quickly as um, sort of an introduction to CPG Consultants what we do and what I do, okay? Then maybe you just leave more time for Q&A. Okay, boring, okay. Um, but I still have to say it, right? Okay, <laughs> CPG Consultants, okay, our design philosophy to ensure each and our, our projects leave a legacy for future generations. 
where millions of people have been and will benefit from. Now, I believe in it. It's just I've been saying it too much. Okay, and we actually cover the whole chain, okay, from being a developer, project managers as consultants, facility managers, okay, and everything else, except that we do not construct for CPG consultants. Okay, and we have offices all over the world. Of course, we're in Singapore, we have offices in China, Philippines, Dubai, okay, India. And we do a whole range of projects. I'm sure you will find a lot of these projects here quite familiar. Okay, uh, National Gallery, the Changi Airport Terminal 1, 2, 3, for example. So we always like to say that you know, in CPG Consultants, we design from cradle to grave. You know, basically, we design hospitals where you're born, you know, KK hospitals. Okay, then when you grow up, you know, you go to schools. Yes, we design schools. Okay, and when you graduate, you go out to work, we design offices. And of course, we also do residential. And when you grow old, you fall sick, you go back to the hospital. And when you die, okay, we also design crematoriums. Okay, so cradle to grave. So I think we are very proud to just showcase some of our projects, you know, that our National Gallery that won the Present Design Award. And of course, the other projects uh, include Gardens by the Bay, Kudai Port Hospital, and of course, our National History Museum. So, um, we'll not talk too much, but maybe emphasize on what I do. Okay, now, uh, I actually hit one of the design offices in CPG Architects. Okay, uh, we have nine studios, and I hit one of them, but I specialize in healthcare. So, unfortunately, you're going to hear a lot from me about healthcare. Okay, so what we do, okay, are basically creating health-oriented developments, okay, creating innovative, creative, innovative, creative and sustainable developments. So certain of our six principles, we want to look at the overall care model, basically from, can you see, can you see, okay, basically from primary care, basically you know from the polyclinics, all the way to acute hospitals like Kutik Pot down to step-down care like nursing homes, and down to palliative care, where you pass away. We have to design facilities that are sustainable. We have to integrate with the community, because we no longer see hospitals as you know, a standalone facility you know, that you know, nobody wants to go to. So now we always plan for it to be integrated with the community. Innovative. We we'll look into the future, and of course, using cytogenic principles, we want to be close to nature. So, one of the examples in Ng Fong General Hospital, whereby we gave every patient a window. Our implementation, we use the integrated design process, whereby we make sure we accompany the client from inception all the way until completion. Then, maybe just a bit of what. I do. Okay, so um, actually, Kutepot Hospital was my first healthcare project. Before that, I was doing uh, residential park projects. I think maybe some of you have been to Chek Jawa, so that was also my project. Um, and I was also doing uh, residential commercial projects in China, in India. Then came this project. Okay, it was a international design competition. I remember I received the brief was in December two zero zero five, and it was um, very thick. File. I remember reading from the start to the end, and I can't remember what was in front. Okay, so that's how I spent my Christmas in 2005. Okay, we were appointed in 06, okay, and we completed in 2010. Okay, so from the appointment until completion, it was less than four years. It was actually a very tight timeline. So you, maybe, how many of you have been to the hospital? As patient or as a visitor? None. Oh, why so shy? <laughs> okay, just very few. Okay. Now, I think uh, I w maybe you can ask me more questions about this okay, later on, but I think it was quite a benchmark project for me because it was my first hospital and I learned a lot. Okay, uh, what really happened, the insight the, you know, that you won't hear from normal. Architects is what happened was that uh, when I was involved in the project, actually we already have a competition scheme. It was an international design competition. The healthcare wing already designed something. Okay, but my boss then felt that we needed a new approach to hospital. So he got me, okay, a very inexperienced architect who has never designed a hospital before, to do it. Okay, so of course I did something that's very unhospital. 
luckily we won, okay? And that's how it was implemented. So basically, we look at the hospital and design from inside out. If you look at the last generation of hospitals, okay, those were completed between uh, 97 to 99. So you have KK, you have uh, Changi General Hospital, you have Tan Tok Seng. Those were designed like sort of a podium block with the tower on top. You know, so podium is air conditioned, you know, then you have the wall tower on top of it. So you can see Kudipa is designed very differently. Basically, we responded to the pond. Okay, that is next to the site. Actually, there was nothing on the site. It was just an open field. The only thing there was the pond. So there's nothing to respond to. We responded to the pond. Okay, so we actually opened out the hospital to draw nature into the heart of the hospital. So maybe since so many of you haven't been to the place, uh, let me just show you a quick video. Okay, I think this project will give you a quick insight as to what I believe in, in how I do my practice. So, which brings me to the next project, Ng Fong General Hospital. Now, this was actually completed just about slightly less than two years ago. So, this was also another project I was involved in, but not all the way. I was involved until the, we call the facade, okay? So this project is the one that I think demonstrated how we can integrate with the community. It's a very different site. Kutik Port is actually in a residential estate, but Ng Teng Fong, actually, this is just next to my office now, uh, it's actually in a very urbanized site. It's bordered on all sides by roads and shopping malls. But what was interesting is that URA dictated that we must have a level two linkage all the way from the MRT through the shopping malls, through the hospitals to other shopping malls. Okay, so I thought that was in a way a very prescriptive but beneficial way of integrating the hospital to the larger community. 
Okay, so some of these ideas you see here, but I think what was really um, groundbreaking for this project was how we designed the wards. It started out during the design competition whereby I remember in locked in a conference room with all the other consultants, and we had this vision. We said, oh, you know, um, why must the patient ward be designed in a very prescribed way, you know, just because it's been done for ages and ages, you know? Why is it that, especially in our Singapore context, where you have cohort wards, meaning you have more than one patient in the room, why is it that only the patient next to the window gets the view? You know, why can't every patient have a view? So that was the vision, and we set out to do it. So that was how this whole design came about. And what we heard was that um, we were not the obvious choice, you know, that time during the design competition. And because they didn't quite understand it. So we also, we also realized at that point during the competition, it was a make or break situation. Either they think that, oh, wow, you know, it's a fantastic idea, they'll buy it, or they think you're nuts, you know, and then we'll be out. So we're very lucky that at the point, the COO, okay, and one of the director of nursing saw what we had to offer. And what I heard from them is that, you know, they say, Jerry, you must thank us. We pulled our CEO back to look at your scheme, and that's how you won, you know. So we delivered, and I think what was interesting is how the wards and how the landscape are integrated to create a more, you know, interesting view from the patient bed side. Because instead of looking out and you see shopping malls and the roads, you get to see a slice of greenery. I think at the same time, I think I want to bring you a bit further, okay, um, maybe just to showcase some of these projects that I do overseas as well. In my line of work, I get to travel quite a bit, and this project was especially um, say interesting for me because what happened was uh, you have uh, about let me see one seven so about seven years ago okay this group of doctors okay developers you know they you know this main guy this doctor is a heart surgeon he has this vision he says he wants to create a hospital that is free of charge meaning you walk in okay you will get a free consultation you get free treatment, you will get free medication, all funded by zakat, okay, the Muslim way of giving back, okay, in terms of contribution. So he approached us to design sort of a master plan for him because they are getting very successful and people are giving them a lot more money, giving them land to develop the hospital, and they need to expand from the current 200-bit hospital to a 1,500-bit hospital just to cater to the demand. Because you can imagine it's a free hospital. So you have unlimited demand. Okay, so what happens? You have unlimited demand, you have all the money, but then you need to make sure you plan properly. Otherwise, you're wasting a lot of money. So this is the context. You can imagine how different it is compared to Singapore. I mean, I have many, many stories to share. Okay, when we were there, we met, we saw all the riots, you know, you know people having firearms, you know, setting fires everywhere, okay? It's the sort of environment whereby I don't think any normal Singaporean would think of going there for leisure. But we went because we believe in the vision and we wanted to contribute, okay? So we actually, you know, if you say Ng Teng Fong was version one of giving every patient a window, this was actually like version two, whereby, you know, Ng Teng Fong is a much more organic shape. This is, we straighten it out. You can see that it's much on a more regular grid. So it was version 2. And we subsequently developed version 3, version 4 in other parts of the world. So just some views. Okay, the hospital, you know, they even have a university. And of course, the center of the whole development is the mosque. Everything centers around the mosque. And of course, uh, we also work in China, so Kun San Si. So of course, it's a very different context, you know, very different environment, very different cultural experience. So you have to see how we integrate some of this you know, more subtle language into the architecture, but yet not compromising on efficiency and our belief to create a healing environment, not just for the patients, but for all its users, whether you're a visitor or you are staff who's using the space. And maybe to end off, uh, it's a bit a quick one on what I'm doing now. Um, besides other overseas projects, but the anchor project for me now is uh, National Centre for Infectious Diseases. So it's actually opposite Tan Tok Seng Hospital now. If you go there, you see this huge monster coming out along Jalan Tan Tok Seng. 
Now, it's actually a redevelopment of what we call CDC, uh, Communicable Disease Center, into a much more high density okay, um, disease, infectious disease center. So, if you look at the overall master plan for Tan Tok Seng, what we call Health City Novena, you see Tan Tok Seng here. Okay, and um, right now on site, you have Lee Kong Chin School of Medicine already up. Okay, and this is the building. Okay, the yellow one is National Center for Infectious Diseases. And the pink one behind is also part of the development. It's what we call Center for Healthcare Innovation. So it is actually a facility that you know, helps to educate you know, health practitioners. But it's also, on a larger context, the buffer from, for the residents. So can you imagine if you are the, you know, staying in a condo here, the last thing you want is a center for infectious disease next to you, right? So we have this building to buffer against the residences. So all of it is integrated through link bridges, you know, underground connections. And basically it's like you know, a whole building of isolation rooms whereby you can even treat Ebola cases. So that is how Singapore Healthcare reacts to so-called cu current challenges and threats. Just some quick images. We are completing the project uh, early next year, but the operational date will be end next year. Okay, I'll just end and pass on the mic to Lawrence. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, so for our next speaker, I'd like to um, welcome uh, Lawrence Lair from um, RSP Architects. Lawrence Lair is an architect with years of experience gathered from both Singapore and the UK. Prior to joining RSP Architects, he has worked at um, RSHP, SOM and IJP Corporation in London. His diversified portfolio covers residential, education, religious, author healthcare project, institutional and hospitality projects, infrastructure, sports, recreation, and master plan projects. Lois is one of the two designers of the Henderson Waves that we probably all know, uh, which has garnered multiple awards, including the prestigious President's Design Award. Lawrence currently teaches at the NUS Schools of Architecture and also has taught at the A School of Architecture in London. So, so let's welcome Lawrence. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Jerry, for giving us a wonderful presentation. I have to really congratulate him for all the beautiful works that he has done for us in Singapore. And, uh, you know, I always wanted to do a hospital, but every time when I see him, I just couldn't get a job. Yeah. I've tried a few hospitals actually, that's why I, I told you that I saw you a few times, but yeah. But nevertheless, uh, I did a little small nursing home actually. Um, but uh, maybe, maybe. Yeah. Change. <coughs> okay. <coughs> I understand today uh, we are supposed to talk about the architect uh, and the large firm, but for me, I think it should be architect in the large firm. Yeah, um, why is it's kind of a, you know architects? You know, you work in small office, you work in big office, medium office. There are different kind of offices. You get different experience. I have to say that um, perhaps I'm quite fortunate to work in uh, uh, varying sizes of offices over my years of experience. Um, so maybe I'll share with you a little bit more about myself, um, what are my experiences as an architect in these offices. Uh, so a bit of growing up, um, I did my architecture in NUS uh, in the 90s, you know, when tropical architecture was the craze, everybody is doing Balinese architecture, you know, I, I believe you also did the same thing, right? So year one, we are doing like, we have to visit Bali, know how to do a Bali house and all the Koyak house because Tan Hock Bing wrote about the tropical uh, architecture. So um, that was in the 90s, right? So uh, this is actually Singapore in the 90s, the skyline. You can, you can see that actually the MBS was not built, um, you know, so it is kind of comfortable back then. Uh, I remember, you know, it was very nice. I used to walk around 
uh, Chinatown and the city to take photos because I was quite an avid photographer then. Um, and I really was amazed by all these buildings that I see. And that's why I decided, you know, instead of becoming a doctor, I chose to become an architect. Yeah. So um, I do have a choice back then. Yeah. So um, moving forward, so after, after I did my first three years uh, in NUS, I decided, I mean, back then we have to do internship, right? So I decided to join uh, MKPR Architects. Over then, uh, Manco and Piling, they were still quite young. La, but uh, they, it was a very small office, about, uh, I remember, eight, eight person office. Uh, the office was still very young. I think it was established uh, only about two or three years. Yeah, They started out uh, as a young architect, as an emerging architect back then. And uh, together with uh, Richard Hassel and, uh, and uh, Mansam, they, they kind of worked together in the beginning as well. So, but I have to highlight them because I think they also play a significant part of my career. Uh, they went the extra mile. When I worked there, they were very accommodating. They were very good mentors. And, and that's why I actually learned a lot of things uh, from them. And even when I have to you know, submit for competition, uh, for the RBA competition, uh, Mankok actually went the extra mile of helping me to arrange the, the guys from the shop to do the slides and help me to send and career my submission to, to UK. Um, so I always remember them and, and we are still friends until today. And much, many years later, Piling became my, my, my examiner, uh, my PPE supervisor as well. Yeah. So what happens after MKPL? Um, I went to London, um, not by chance, uh, it's because uh, I earlier mentioned that I submitted for the RIBA uh, President's Medal. So I won the RIBA President's Medal for part one, and, um, and that's why I went to London. And when I was in London, um, yeah, this is the, my final year project for year three, actually. Um, it's actually a photo photographic park. Uh, nobody wanted to do an underground building, but I'm the only one who went against the rule and do an underground building. All the professors and tutors say that, you know, it's not going to work. Uh, it's going to be costly. It doesn't make sense. Uh, how are you going to do it? And there's no building uh, because, you know, to pass your exam, you have to do a building. So I decided not to do a building. Um, and in the end, I did an underground uh, building instead. So I, I did a park right on top and with the building and all the facilities actually right below. So um, there's the exhibition in RIBA. Um, it was quite amazing because over there I met my next mentors. Um, the RIBA president back then was uh, Marco Goldschmidt. He, he is a partner of uh, Richard Rogers. And uh, that's my lovely wife there, uh, girlfriend then, sorry. Yeah. So we went over together and I received the medal from uh, the Marco himself. And what is amazing is that they actually offered me a job, right, to, to do an internship with uh, the office. And that's why I actually um, learned something different again. Uh, that's Riverside Studios, uh, Richard Rogers' office. And uh, over there I met amazing people. And that's again a place where I started to learn and build up my philosophy, my design, right? And over there, I, I saw John drawing all the one is to one details by hand, free sketch, and that's really amazing. And we do a lot of uh, computational design as well back then to figure out, you know, for example, this one, this is a National Assembly of Wales roof, yeah. So again, this, this experience here actually anchored my belief that um, we should celebrate public spaces, which are important. Every building should try to give back to the society in some ways, be it a space, be it a park, um, be it a space. So then after that, I went to the AA. Um, it's again another different ex learning experience, very different from NUS. I had to spend six months of my initial months to unlearn what I have learned in NUS. And that again helps me to question uh, the way I do design. And at the AA, I met George, who was my uh, final year tutor, uh, George Laropoulos. Um, 
And he's another guy who also went the extra mile, yeah, guiding me and teaching me. And later on, we actually collaborated together on the Henderson Wave, which I will show you later. So that is uh, actually uh, a, a rapid prototype model that we did in Oslo. That was in year 2001 or two. Back then, I think competitional design was still not um, kind of uh, done in Singapore yet, but we were doing it back then in uh, the AA. And that is actually the salt and pepper uh, model that I made using a uh, parametric design. So then I went on to also teach in the AA, where I have my own summer school studio. And uh, again, I created my own agenda based on what I'm interested in. And um, we look at you know, how things can change and vary yeah, to the environment. So after school, I actually went to SOM. Now, here this is the real big practice that I, I joined. It was a conscious decision because I have worked in a small office, I've worked in a medium office like Richard Rogers, and I decided not to go back to Richard Rogers, but decided that I want to join SOM because I'm interested in doing big buildings. I want a different um, uh, experience. So I, I interviewed, my, I, make, I got interviewed there, and I, I got into the firm, and um, I met wonderful people again. And these are my mentors. I mean, Michelle, I think uh, three weeks ago, he came to NUS for a lecture as well. He gave a lecture, and we met 10 years on. He, he, he himself uh, learned under Bruce Graham, the, one of the famous architects of SOM, and he was a great mentor. He taught me about how, to, how the, the SOM way of designing skyscrapers. And I met a lot of other people you know, who are good, still good friends with me now. So um, it was an invaluable experience. And um, you know, who says that big you know, offices come to design? Do you have to work in a small practice to be an emerging architect? Is it only when you work in a small office you can do what you want? Not really. I have to say that um, when I was in SOM, I got to kind of develop uh, what I wanted to do uh, in terms of uh, parametric design. And what you see here is actually the, the, the changing floor plates of a skyscraper. Yeah? We did a lot of variations to the form and the facade, yeah? and lots of modeling as well. You know, as a young graduate, I did all this model in two nights using um, laser cutting machines. Yeah. So um, there's a lot of rigor and there's a lot of uh, critique and discussion with the team. And that was my desk back then. You can see how many models I've made. And um, yeah, there's no flat screen. It was a big CRT screen. Yeah, this looks like an antique now, right? Yeah. But back then, there's a lot of modeling and there's a lot of process work. And I believe very strongly in the process of the design. Not so much the end product, but how do we actually do design? So having said that, I think um, why I want to say transformation by design, because I believe that through design, you can change things. Uh, so after SOM, what happens? Um, I came back to Singapore. This is where I left. And when I came back, everything is changing. Yeah. Um, the government decided to build the Marina Bay Sands and property price are going up. I'm really stressed up when I came back to Singapore because everything is just moving so fast paced. Yeah. So I came back to RSP. Um, why I came back to RSP? Because uh, they sponsored me to study in AA. So I was uh, on a scholarship. So I have to come back and serve my bond. Yeah. So it just happened to be like that, yeah. But uh, I think the good thing about RSP is that they have given me the chance to extend my bond so that I can actually work in UK for two years. And that actually helped to shape my um, thoughts and my experience. So when I came back, this, this, this is my, my office actually. Uh, you must be wondering what we are doing. We are not doing models, we are actually eating. Um, we really like to eat, right? Architects like to eat and talk and talk, yeah, but never get any work done. So, um, and you can see it's, it's, it's quite scary. There are lots of files behind, you know. All these are project management documents. I was shocked because it was totally different from SOM. Yeah, the way of working is really different. Uh, the culture is different. So I basically have a cultural shock, yeah. 
Over there, you know, I do one project for one whole year, but here I have to do 12 projects in one whole year, maybe. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, but RSP has since changed. Uh, this is our design office now, and that's, I'm sitting somewhere there with my team now. Um, yeah, things have changed, things have moved on. Um, how do we do it? Because we design for it. Okay, a little bit of uh, marketing here, right? Uh, I'm not going to do too much, but if you want to know more about RSP, just go onto the website, www.rsp.sg. Okay? Um, RSP is a company with a long history, 60 years of history. Uh, it was set up by uh, actually two British partners uh, in, the, in the 1950s. And uh, we also have quite a few offices worldwide. I actually can't remember how many of them, but uh, go and find out on the website. Yeah. So we, we like to focus on people. Yeah, we believe in uh, people development. Uh, I myself believe very much in mentoring people because of my own personal experience, um, I make it a point to mentor the younger generation as well as the architects that work with me. Yeah. So as architects, what do you do in a big firm? You shape environment. And I think in a big office, you have a lot more opportunities to do different kind of projects and uh, have a wide range of experience. And I think more importantly, I want to emphasize is to that you can actually work with different people. There's a lot of collaboration within the office and with the people outside the office. Yeah. So uh, you may realize that if you're working in a small office, there are some limitations because partly because you can't tender for a bigger project. Yeah, there are some limitations, and you may be doing houses and houses and houses. Uh, nothing to do wrong with doing houses. I do houses too. I just completed one for my sister. Um, but I think it's quite interesting because I then get to, to use my knowledge and, and ability to design the details into a house, and it's a totally different thing. Yeah. So, um, yeah, this is a portfolio of RSP. Um, again, you can find more on the website, but these are the key projects that we have done recently. Um, that's uh, Westgate Shopping Centre. That project is the uh, dormitory in NTU. We collaborated with Toyo Ito. And that's my project that I just co recently completed in Pongo. It's a Church of Transfiguration and uh, another Capital Mall Shopping Centre. Uh, Interlace with uh, Ole Shirin. Uh, now we are also doing the um, the jewel in Changi is uh, we, together with Moshi Safti and uh, conservation houses, residential infrastructure, hotel schools, and so on. Yeah. So, <coughs> what is design? Right. Um, I always question what is design. Yeah. So I think design is about creation and innovation, and design is an everyday interaction. Design can be transformative. It can enhance the way people experience the spaces, the places, whether is it a building or a park or a city, even down to the way you design a handle or a door detail, it's very important. Yeah? And what else is important? Your clients. Right? Without the client, you can never have any other project to do. Yeah? So clients are a very important thing. Um, we work with them closely to understand what they need, and uh, we collaborate with them throughout the whole process. And um, the other thing is uh, context. Yeah? I find context is very important. Your building has to engage the environment, the context. And you have to look at the broader context, the environment, and then start looking from outside and inside of your building. So with that, maybe I'll just touch on a few projects for, uh, to share with you. Um, I've done a lot of different projects, I think so many different kinds that I can't really remember or but uh, perhaps a few significant ones will be Henderson Wave itself. Um, Henderson Wave is actually a competition organized by URA in 2003, 2004 actually. And back then I was actually in SOM working and uh, this competition came about and uh, I was quite excited about it. I spoke to George, um, my tutor from, NU, uh, from AA, and we, we kind of uh, agreed that perhaps we can take on this uh, competition. 
uh, not planning to win actually, uh, we actually thought we wouldn't because uh, what we, uh, we did is totally kind of uh, uh, different from what other people has done. So, um, so this is the site. The, the whole brief is actually to link Mount Faber to Tolo Blanca and then to the Alexandra Park where the hot park is. Yeah, so that, that's the main brief because they wanted to connect the, the, the urban, uh, the, the, the parks together over a series of uh, connect, connected linkways. So that was a very pristine site in the beginning. And this is actually the competition submission that we did, um, just the two of us. Yeah? Um, in a way, it, it's like a start startup practice. Um, we really have no money. Yeah, we, we, we just did it out of the backyard in the house. And uh, we furthered what we have done in the AA as a research. It was actually part of my final year project and where I actually uh, look at how parametric forms um, can be constructed or fabricated using uh, uh, conventional uh, technology. So uh, we did a lot of math. Um, this is actually the concept board we, we can see on the left hand side is actually the, the plan with the varying uh, sections and we are thinking how do we construct this form actually because uh, it is three-dimensionally curved right so we, we try to um, change the, the equation and try to make every element two-dimensional so by doing so we are able to fabricate using large laser cutting machines that uh, the industry use. Right. And at the same time, we also ask ourselves, uh, what is a bridge? Is, is a bridge meant to be just connecting two points? Yes, it serves that functionally. But uh, what I believe is, I wanted to create a place for everybody. Yeah? And it has to do be more than just a bridge connecting two points. It has to be an event space uh, for people. Yeah? So there's the equation, don't ask me what is it, but I've long forgotten it. Um, but uh, we spend a lot of time doing the computation. Um, yeah. So this is the transformation of the surface. And you can see they are actually made out of two dimensional sections. And these actually are also the center lines of the structure. So by doing so, we are able to integrate the structure and the form together and fabricate it. This was my final year project where we, I also look at the two-dimensional construction of the 3D form. Yeah. So this actually was the first generation. So when I did the Henderson Wave, we thought maybe this can be a bridge. So we decided to further develop it to what it is. So there's another of the board of the submission. You realize there's no rendering, it's all black and white. Everybody has beautiful renderings, night shot, area view, full of trees. We only have black and white drawings. Yeah. So, because we really have no budget. Yeah, I, I did this model myself. So, yeah, even the board I did myself. Yeah. So, and even the model I did it myself. <laughs> so, we, we, we did that model in the AA, the laser cutting machine. Um, and uh, it was quite enjoyable process actually. And uh, that was the final submission and we won. We, we were actually shortlisted among three firms and URA kind of not one, anybody from URA here? Yeah. yeah, they didn't give out the, the top prize. They shortlisted three and they gave all three merit prizes. So kind of strange, right? So, but uh, I think all of the three entry that we submit, uh, that was shortlisted, um, they commented, I mean, one of the structural professor in NTU actually commented that this bridge cannot be built. It doesn't work. Yeah, but I think we proved him otherwise. Nah. So um, that was the laser model. Um, we were very single-minded developing the design. Even the terrain is, you know, using two-dimensional laser cutting. Yeah. <coughs> That's me in the backyard. Yeah. So it's a one-man, two-man show and uh, George was busy teaching, I was busy working on the back, in the backyard. And that's how uh, the process is actually. Yeah. So that's me making the model, you see that, the base model? Yeah. And laser cutting everything and trying to stick things together. 
Yeah, so it was quite a, a process actually. So when the project got on to design development stage, I decided to come back to Singapore um, because actually partly because this project was a tie up between RSP and IJP. Yeah, I kind of planned to do that because I wanted to give back to my company. So I tied the company up and we got the project and RSP is the the uh, architect in Singapore going to implement the project. So I came back, I started work, um, and I went through this uh, the project implementation for this project. And what you see here is that the construction uh, that's happening here. And I don't remember if anybody has done fair face concrete back then in year 2006, but we were trying very hard to achieve the same quality as what I see in, U in UK, because Norman Foster was doing beautiful concrete structures, right? So I also want to do the same thing. So it was so difficult because of also budget constraint. URA gave me a budget of uh, 7.5 million for this bridge, but he gave the marina double helix 30 million. So not fair, right? Yeah, it's the same length of the bridge actually. Yeah, so, uh, but nevertheless, we, we make do with what we have. Um, so everything is quite raw. Um, and we did a lot more carbs on how the timber deck can be and how it can be modular uh, in terms of the component design. So there's a lot of uh, component design involved in this process. And down to the detail of the steel, um, how I wanted the expression of the corner and the joints, uh, I worked it out everything. And, but I think very importantly, I worked very closely with my structural engineer. This belief came from my experience in SOM. Uh, when I was in SOM, the engineer just sits behind me um, and we worked very closely and he helped me to realize my design. But I realized when I came back to Singapore, it's a totally different thing. Um, the engineers, you know, always tell me, you know, it can't be done, it can't be done, it can't be done. So um, he also told me the same thing, it can't be done. And when he told me that this beam, there's the point of inflection has to be two meters deep, I nearly fell off the chair. So I told him, no, this cannot be the way because my, my, my surface has to be as seamless and smooth, right? So I started to become an engineer myself. And I tell him, you know, let's sit down together and talk. Um, so we worked together and we finally came up with, with a solution to make it really uh, small, small and uh, slender. Yeah? So that this point of inflection is, is, is not like a big fat uh, structure. So we went down to, to Malaysia. The, the, the steel structure was fabricated in Malaysia, Pasikudong. And, um, and we did a lot of uh, mock-up and, uh, uh, and look at the detail and how things are being connected before the final structure was being uh, fabricated. So what you see here is actually the steel structure. And that's the rib. You know, that, so everything came from the center line of the parametric model. Yeah. So you have the main members here the big arch, and then the, the uh, mid-span member. So in using parametric design, we can actually uh, vary the height of the structure based on what the engineer wanted in terms of the structural requirements. Yeah? So that, I don't know if anybody have, of you have seen this when you are younger, uh, in 2005. Um, we actually, brought the entire structure at night to the site and lifted onto a temporary working platform and so that the, the vehicles below can actually continue to, to flow and works continue to be carried out on top in a safe uh, environment. So that is very important because as a designer, you have to think, how can I realize my project? Yeah? How can it be built? It's not just about design. Design is only 30%. Yeah, the rest of the 70% is all about carrying out the project and project management. Yeah. <coughs> so there is part of the bridge being you know, filled up with the uh, timber, timber boards. Uh, this actually, it, we, are, we actually use a uh, hardwood uh, balau timber. Um, why I chose that? Because I, I really like the color. Because when it ages, it actually becomes, a, a, it has a silverish, sheen and I like the texture of it. Yeah. So there's a lot of um, craftsmanship involved 
Uh, you can see here, this man is actually cutting pieces and, you know, and inserting it into the, the, the steel structure. So all these details are being carefully designed and planned for so that when it's being constructed, it can be done in as uh, shortest time as possible. So that's a completed deck. You know, we, we even put in details like I thread 760. It's, it's actually the, the, the number of the spine in the parametric form. We wanted people to know how it came about so that the bridge is, is something that is more than just a bridge. We also added information like how, how high are you above the, the, the sea level. So this is the bridge as it is today. I still remember when it was just completed, I was very surprised that it feels like a shopping mall. It was so crowded and it took me a long time to walk from one end to the other end. Uh, I don't feel like I'm in nature, um, but perhaps that actually uh, encouraged me and inspired me in some ways because I started to realize that I can have the power to transform, yeah? transform the experience of people as an architect. And, um, and that actually starts to um, drive my passion to do my, my next project better and better, and to design for the people and design for the environment. So the bridge, as it is today, you can see you know, the young, the elderly, the old people, handicapped people can all access the bridge with no issues. So that's how it looks like in nature. And that's me and George standing on top. Again, it's about collaboration. Yeah? You cannot work alone as an architect. And that's, of course, the, is a, is a collective effort, right? With the clients. That's why the clients are important because the clients are really good. And the contractors, we work very well together. There's a contractor there. That's my client. Um, and that's the engineer. Yeah. Okay, moving on to the next project. Um, after Henderson Wave, what's next? Um, is the IT College Central at Amokyo. This was actually a competition, um, and uh, it was an invited, I think, invited or shortlisted competition. You can't remember actually. Um, but we were competing against all the big firms like DP, Aders, who just came into the market, and uh, the, everybody is very aggressive and hungry. And um, so we decided that we we're not going to lose the competition. So we cooped ourselves up in a secret room for three months, eating and sleeping there. Yeah, that's passion, right? Yeah. So um, for weeks, we couldn't come up with any ideas, yeah, the, the, the few of us. So um, we were kind of like, oh no, you know, what we're we going to do? We, we have to win the project. Yeah? Everybody, the livelihood of 1,000 people in the office depends on us for the next two years. So we have to get a fees, yeah. So, um, so one night, I just couldn't sleep. Yeah, I decided to, to wake up and uh, sit on my dining table. My wife is sleeping, sound asleep. Um, and then I started sketching. So that was the sketch uh, that I did that fateful night. Yeah. So the next day, I brought the drawing to, to the office and showed my bosses, you know. So because we had this uh, director's uh, design meeting. So back then, I was just a young architect. So, uh, and then they decided, okay, maybe this is a scheme forward. So, you know, despite the hierarchy, I think, I think they believe in, in the sketch that I did. So we decided to push ahead with this option. And um, there is a building as it is today. Uh, you don't see much changes, but I know there are some adjustments made, but the concept is pretty much the same. Um, I kind of brought along with me my experience in London. You know, when I was working in Rich they talk about environmental design. Yeah? Back then, Green Mark is still you know, starting in Singapore, but I believe that the building should be shaped by environment. So we, we created this uh, central spine, which is north-south. Yeah? It's along the prevailing wind. And that actually allows the space to be naturally ventilated. Yeah? And we decided to put a roof over it so that people can comfortably walk below and carry out activities as well. And I think the key important thing about this master plan is that if you look at here, there's the Central Expressway, right, CTE. 
Um, I think IT itself has come a long way compared to the 1980s where, where it is viewed as a school for the dropouts. But if you look at IT today, the students actually want to be there. And it has the, in, in other words, we are able to transform their life through our architecture. Yeah? So indeed, the architecture has transformed the image of the school. So much so that I think uh, PM Lee is very proud of this uh, development that he, he held two of his uh, National Day rally there. And um, yeah. So that is the uh, competition submission. Uh, it was meant to be one headquarters and four colleges. That's what the, the program asked for. And we have this challenging brief of where to put the sports, uh, sports track. And we decided that you know, we wanted people to, to identify ITE yeah, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, 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 a, as a good school and a place to be. So we kind of set a world stage for them to exhibit the schools. And that's the school as it is today. From another angle. So this was what we submitted. The concept was actually to slice up the building into different parts, but to seamlessly connect via the, they call it the inspiration zone, where the students can actually come out to exhibit their projects, interact with the industry. But I think more importantly is, again, I wanted to create a public space where anybody can walk in. And that has become what it is today. You can just walk in and uh, nobody's going to stop you. That's the central spine. And we work together closely with our uh, landscape consultant, Grant Associates, to come up with a seamless uh, landscape design where we have sunken gardens, uh, uh, tree pots where people can dwell, and with a water feature that actually connects from one end to the other end of the building. So that's a 3D of the central spine and what it is today. It's probably one of the largest green wall in Singapore. And there's actually the, the, the atrium in the middle. So the green spine is just right behind, connecting all the different nodes of the building. So that's the ceiling roof on top. So again, I want to emphasize that the building should be designed for people and how they actually use the building at the end of the day is being shaped by your building. It's an evening shot. Okay, one of my latest projects I just completed recently is the uh, Church of Transfiguration in uh, Pongo. Uh, Pongo, this is the Pongo New Town and the site is somewhere near here. Again, it's actually a competition project. Um, the, the church actually uh, invited a few architects, and again, I very much wanted to win this project. So we put in a lot of effort, my team. And the church is actually named after the, uh, the idea of the transfiguration in the Bible. So there was actually this uh, scene in the Bible where Jesus transfigured on Mount Tabor. And this is believed to be where the original site and there's actually original Church of Transfiguration up there. So we decided that, um, we kind of thought about it and, and felt that the church should be a place where uh, you come closer to God. So how do you come closer to God? So in, 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 the, in the biblical accounts, most of the time you actually go up to the mountain. So we wanted to create this uh, sense of ascension from the ground to a higher ground. So we did that starting and we break up the volume it's like a rock pulling apart yeah, and enter into this womb and eventually, you know, we as the sinful people start to walk towards God, trying to be holy. Yeah. And um, at the end of the day, God embraces you yeah, in, in communion. So that's like the spreading arm of God, the brown colour one, you know, embracing you and hugging you. Yeah, because He's always forgiving. So this is the building as it is today. Uh, this is the, the volume of the main hall. And there is actually the, uh, the ancillary facilities on the left. So these are the design strategies we put into place. What are the sacred spaces? What are the green spaces? Uh, what are the extended seating areas? And this is usually how I, I progress my design. 
Yeah, it's, it's quite standard after a while. Yeah. So that's a floor plan. The whole idea is also to, again, to celebrate public spaces. I don't believe that a church should be a place just for the, the religious people and for the people from the denomination or whichever. So I wanted to create a public space where the people of Pongo can actually come closer to the church and engage with the church. So we kind of push the fence all the way to the back. Uh, in fact, you, you don't even feel a fence because they are open up during the day. And you can actually walk all the way up to the second story near the door. Yeah. So that's the site. Uh, that's Pongo Waterway. Waterway Terrace by Aedas. Um, surprisingly, I mean, this building actually blocked all the wind that I need. So there's no ventilation for my building. So what do we do? If you go to the church today, actually it's very windy below because of the way we, we plan the building to allow this uh, porosity to flow through. So it's completed now. I think two months ago we had the inauguration. So the roof garden, you actually walk on top. That's the priest quarter. These are all the prayer room, classroom here. That's the main sanctuary at the back. You can go and you can go there and count how many crosses are there. If you get get it correctly, you get an internship job in RSP. Yeah, yeah. There's a there's a number. I think it's probably the it has the most number of crosses in in Singapore or in the world. Yeah. So, yeah, try, try, try and go do it. So, this is where I meant the public space in front. You can actually walk very close up front and all the way up the staircase. There's a public space. You can walk up through the staircase. It's all naturally ventilated. And you come to the foyer of the main century. So we wanted to create a naturally ventilated space again. So this space is so well ventilated that actually rain came in um, all the way in and it's flooding. Yeah, and we have to do something about it. Yeah. It wasn't planned for, but yeah, it's a shower of blessings, you call it. Yeah. So you don't need to water the plants, they all get watered. <laughs> yeah. I have a video actually very, very interesting. The priest was actually trying to scoop all the water out of the building. Yeah. But you know that's like one in a you know few months time. So, yeah. So, that's the when you enter the church. This is the sanctuary, uh, very traditional in some ways, very solemn, and uh, we want yes we wanted to create this solemnity, yeah, this sense of uh, holiness in the church because that's what a church should be, and we got to actually work very closely with this uh, stained glass artist from uh, Italy. He's an amazing artist. You can, he actually, you know, draw every image by himself and just with him and his helper, they lift it up, all this stained glass within a day, yeah. So the church hall itself is divided into two tiers because in Singapore, you know, land is really tight and the church actually spent a lot of money buying the land from the government for 30 years only. So, and everything has to be fitted into a very small site. So. The design is really compact, but at the same time, how do we, as architects, help the client to fulfill all their requirements within a tight site? So what we did is that we actually avoid going down another basement, which is going to be very costly, right? The church really has no money. They had to fundraise from zero. But the government insisted that they have to provide more car parks than what is required because they are afraid that churchgoers park in the HDB estate. So they added more than what is required in the, in the guideline. So we really had a big issue because then, you know, on one hand, we had to value, uh, balance the cost and the design. So we lifted the church hall off the ground, which is also based on what our concept is. Lift it up, and then we create a sheltered car park space, which can also be used for fun fairs. So it becomes a multi-purpose space. So design is an experience to me. And there are many ways you can do it to create different experiences. So it becomes part of the waterway terrace now. So 
uh, after doing quite a number of projects, I have to speed up. Okay, last one. Okay. Um, recently, I got to do a project in Kazakhstan. I think it's quite interesting. Um, we kind of pioneered the, the project from Singapore. Uh, the client wanted a, a design from Singapore, basically. So um, I was asked to help the client to do a feasibility study and explore the, the, the potential market in Kazakhstan. So I flew there quite a number of times, and uh, it was quite an interesting site. And there's actually a condominium and house. So you ask me whether you get to do a house or a small house. Yes, in a big practice, you still do when you have rich clients. Yeah. So there's the project. We submitted, we have to present to the, the mayor to get his approval, and he kind of really liked the design. Uh, it's the first time they have a Singapore practice coming to, to Kazakhstan to design something. So they are all, you know, very, very excited about it, even though they speak Russian, you know. So um, we try to talk to each other as much as possible. So there's the site now under construction during winter. And if you go to YouTube, you can actually Google it and you can see the contractor uploaded this uh, drone image and video on top. So there's actually a Tian San mountain, you know, like, like the Wu Xia Xiao Suo Tian San. So I was quite amazed by, by that. And it's a beautiful site. So these are my clients again, and uh, very young client, and uh, very nice chief architect of the most established architectural firm in, in, in uh, Kazakhstan. Um, so they all speak Russian and I can't, so, but we enjoy working with each other a lot. So it is about transformation through design, and it is about collaboration. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much. It's been quite exciting to listen to you both your stories about like playing a role in a large firm. Um, it's almost uh, eight, but maybe we'd just like uh, to get together for a very short discussion and like uh, hope we're also going to have um, some time for, for questions of the audience and I hope they're going to be questions. Um, Lawrence, it was, it was quite kind of interesting to listen to your kind of presentation because you first shared about your personal story uh, and your biography of becoming an architect and actually like kind of going abroad, coming back to Singapore uh, and you just really spoke about like kind of um, the cultural shock, the cultural shock that you probably both experienced when you went to London and quite interesting when you came back to, to Singapore. Just, um, would you recommend our students to also face such cultural shocks? Is there some kind of benefit to it? Uh, yes, I, I believe it's a good thing. Uh, it's always good to pu pull yourself out from a comfortable environment. I think we are all too comfortable in where we are sometimes. And um, to put ourselves in a situation of change I think that's the only way we can transform ourselves, our skill set, our knowledge. And uh, this is how I actually benefited from my experience when I went overseas. I mean, in a way, I, I had the opportunity and, um, and I decided to take it. It is a matter of choice. And I believe that if you don't ask for it, uh, you will never get it. But you never know. You know, how I, when, when I met Marco, he, I asked him, do you have a job for me? If Can I come to work in the office? And he said, yes, why not? So we, we kind of felt that, yeah, if you don't ask, you will never get it. But if you ask, there's always a chance. And the beautiful thing is that then my wife get, went along with me and they hired the both of us as an intern. You know? So we get to be, be enjoying our love life as well and working at the same time. So strangely, we are working in the same office throughout our internship and uh, she has been a bit you know, great support for me as well. That seems to be a fate in our profession that lots of people kind of meet their partner uh, while they're studying, kind of, uh, that's probably because there's no other private life. <laughs> um, Jerry, like, um, Lawrence have been talking about the um, 
power to transform the built environment, actually. And like kind of you shared a bit about like kind of from uh, the many hospital projects that you actually did. Uh, and we probably all know that like kind of hospitals are kind of super complex pro project when it comes to requirements, when it actually comes to meeting the medical aspects, when it comes to meeting the expectations of the clients. Um, and I have like kind of a question I'd like to ask about Cotec Port Hospital because uh, I met like kind of the Alexandra Health people because we're doing some kind of research project with them. Um, and I was kind of wondering, Alexandra Health is probably really a good client to have, right? Just, um, uh, so I want to kind of ask like kind of two questions. Do you think like what is the transformative power you have as an architect when you design something as complex as a hospital? And actually, can you influence things or like kind of to which extent do you really depend on such good clients as uh, Alexandra Health probably is one? That's a very broad question. <laughs> now, uh, maybe just a bit of history then. Um, yes, that project is um, operated by Alexandra Health. So, uh, if you, the history of Kudepot is that it's supposed to be a, what you call a replacement hospital. Meaning, it was supposed to be the replacement for the old Alexandra Hospital along Alexandra Road. So what happens is that when they build a new one in Dishun, all the staff will move from the old hospital to the new hospital. So that was the original plan. But at that point, the ministry didn't realise how acutely short we are of hospital beds. So that is why Alexandra Hospital is still operating after Kudipot was finished. Okay? And now it's become like a training ground for all the new hospitals that's coming up. Um, but what really meant is that the clients already had the experience of running an existing hospital. So they know what it takes to run a hospital. So that time I, I mentioned the brief was this thick because they sort of knew what they wanted. Like I explained, the original generation of hospital were built like 10 years ago from Kudikwat. So things have changed. You know, technology has changed, you know, the more care model has changed. So there are a lot of expectations and a lot of you know, excitement you know, when a team put together the brief. And at that point, for example, um, to get a platinum green mark was something quite extraordinary. Okay? But of course now it's a bit more common with more projects getting certified. But at that point for Coup Port, when that was part of the brief, it really caused a very different type of design to achieve the brief. But it shows that the client sort of like, you know, knew what they wanted because they have traveled all over the world to get, you know, what's called best, ex best examples, you know, good practices, and they all condense it into the brief. So what I felt as an architect, what we brought to the table is how you sort of make sense of all this noise, you know, and you look at the context and see how you put it all together to make it come to reality. How we responded to the site, how we put all the pieces in place, and I thought it was really enjoyable working with them because besides the fact that, you know, they are experienced, uh, it was actually a very much of a learning experience. Like what Lawrence was mentioning is of a collaboration. I think we all learn from each other. You know, what the hospital did is they created a lot of user groups. So they have a work group for each department, of course. But they even have work groups that's for the common areas. For example, you have a toilet work group, you have a landscape work group, you know. So the CEO then, he called himself the chief toilet cleaner. So basically, one of his job is he loves to go around the hospital checking on toilets. But it gives you an idea what sort of person he is. Okay, he's really into the details. Okay, so we get to work with people like that. Okay, and I think, you know, he he always say that you know, um, he's investing a lot of time to educate us, but we. I think on you know look at it the other way we are also educating him because he the user groups have no idea how to put together a building you know they have no idea about sequencing of work you know have no idea how to make things work okay basically so it was really much of a collaboration and the we were very lucky to have a client who really appreciates and believe in what we call biophilic design you know if you look at Alexandra Hospital it's really a large 
you know, really landscape property, you know, it's colonial buildings, three, four stories, you know, about three point, uh, 13 hectares, piece of land. So they wanted to have the same idea in a very much smaller piece of land in Yishun. And so we translated that vision into what you see today. And because they believed in it, it, it wasn't a hard sell on our part to say, you know, how I want to integrate the greenery, how I want to integrate the pond, you know, into the overall design. And they saw the, the beauty of that. Okay, and I guess it was like I said, it was a great, great collaborative effort. And I think it's quite rare to be able to get clients like that. But I think you have to work with what you have. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, so, like, uh, if we compare, like, um, last week's lecture and this week's lecture, so, like, kind of last time we had, like, um, um, Yibian Hong and uh, Tan Kuo Kiang from Forum Architects, and they seem to be super happy with, like, kind of uh, running a small firm, like, kind of... Uh, uh, and you seem to be quite happy with like kind of playing a role in a large firm, and I just wonder what our students actually kind of make make out of it. Actually, um, maybe it would be interesting if you like kind of um, both give some kind of recommendation to the to the students, like kind of should they do both, should they just do one, what should they actually start with, um, and also have like kind of um, a question about your role, like kind of uh, in actually working for a rather large firm because like kind of my experience I've sort of also worked for both large firms and sm um, smaller firms and I always had the impression that like kind of the architects who are actually in responsible positions in the larger firms they are more or less becoming moderators, managers, teachers but they have very little time to really actually design themselves actually just um, um, so maybe since we don't have so much time, so these are just the two questions, like kind of what would be your recommendation to the students, small, large, both, what first, what second? Uh, and also what's your, your how, how do you value your own role, like kind of as a designer in a, in a rather large firm? Actually. Okay. Um, I think what I will recommend is that um, when you are young, uh, don't be afraid of trying different things. Um, as much as possible, try to get a, a wide ranging of experience in small practices, big practices or medium practices, because um, you may realize that certain kind of offices suits your character. Yeah? If you are somebody who enjoys working with more people, definitely big practice is a place for you. Um, but there are some people who prefer to do their own design. Um, they believe in what they are doing, very single-mindedly. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, so I think it's a matter of choice. Um, in a big practice, I think you get to have uh, people with different skill set where you can learn from. Like I mentioned, when I was in SOM, I have the engineer sitting right behind me. Um, we work very closely together and I do enjoy that. And I think it is through this kind of collaboration that I can really do something good. Um, because doing it by yourself can be quite difficult sometimes. And um, as for where I am now, I do agree with you that um, yeah, as we, we move up to a more senior role, uh, we may have less time to actually design. Uh, but I do make it a point uh, to have uh, weekly design discussions with my uh, team. And uh, we do interact and debate and critique about the work, uh, not just on administrative issue, but also the design. And this is something that I always believe in because we need to talk, we need to interact. Um, and this is something that I also Again, while I was working in Richard Rogers, where they always have a Monday director's design meeting, where all the best of minds actually sit together one whole morning and uh, review all the projects, just like you do in the studio. And um, it is through this kind of interaction and critique that you can have a rigorous design that comes out of the, the whole process. And that's where I think 
the, the it's very important that we we have a certain way of working in a big practice. There are different people, different individuals, um, different way of working because of their the nature of the different background that we come from. Um, there are some directors who may not want to have design meetings at all, uh, but there are some you know just believe in project implementation, and they are very good with that. Nothing wrong with that. I think everybody has their own strength, and um, whereas you know. I contribute from the design point of view, and uh, we all form part of a big company, and we deliver the projects that our client wanted. I think at the end of the day, it is not about me, me, me. Yeah, it's at the end of the day, it's about how do we work together to fulfill what the client and what the people want. I think the greatest satisfaction at the end of the day is that when you see the users using the building, and they are happy, and they are very. Um, inspired, I think that's where the satisfaction is. Yeah. So it doesn't matter where you are, whether it's a big or small practice, I think the important thing is what do you really want to achieve at the end of the day? I wouldn't say I will give you any advice per se because it's really up to you. I think everybody wants something different and it's really up to you to find out what you want. And so the maybe the recommendation would be you go and try out yourself. Go and think, okay, if you feel you identify with the practice ideology, then try to get an internship, you know, go experience it. Then see whether it really is what you want. Because I think I think you're right, you're still just starting out, you know, still in school and even when you after you graduate, take your time to figure out what you're really good at. Okay, because frankly, um, maybe a bit contentious to say, but I don't believe the school can teach you anything per se. Okay, you have to go out and work. Then that's real architecture. Okay, that's the real world outside. What the school can is to teach you how to think. You know, how to have the whole broad ideas, but they can't equip you with every skill sets when you go out. Okay, so to find the right fit of what you think you want to do. Okay, what you want to do now, what you want to do in the future, it will change. Okay, so, but that's natural. So just go with the flow, you know, do what you feel is right at that point, okay, and you will find the answer. Okay, I mean, even when I was starting out as a young architect, I, I, I have no idea I'll end up doing healthcare, right? I mean, we started doing whatever comes your way, right? Whatever the boss asks you to do, you have to do it. But you'll come to a point where you just know you have a certain flair or you have a certain preference for a certain type of work, then you will gravitate towards that. Okay, let it come naturally. But of course I think what is important is be you know in the right environment, okay, to interact with the right people. I don't I think that cannot be understated. Okay, that is very important. Okay, so but you must believe in it. Otherwise you're really forcing yourself into a, you know, these circumstances whereby then you're just getting yourself very unhappy. So don't do that. Okay? Just go with the flow, enjoy what you do. Now, I think regarding the role in a big company, I think is uh, again, I identify what Oliver and you know, Lawrence is saying, is very true. At a point where as a young architect, when you first start out, you, have, you feel you have more control over the projects because you're just doing that project or that few projects, right? I mean, down to the, you know, designing the last detail. But as you, you do advance, you know, you get more senior in the company, you have more responsibility, you, you need to learn how to adapt to the changing roles that you have to take. So for me now, I think you're right. I have come to the point whereby I don't do the design myself. It's actually a, you know, this realization up to a certain point in a career, you realize that no, you can't do that. You can't do your design yourself because you'll just kill yourself. So what you have to do is then you say, okay, I have to learn how to do design management. You know, how you start to work with your team, to manage the design process, manage the design, and not to do it yourself. Same thing, okay, so now I'm um, settled with other responsibilities, you know, you have to do all your P&L, you know, administrative, you know, a lot of other responsibilities, but that is part and parcel of an architect's job, lucky or not, okay? So you may say you don't like it, you know, then fine, you know, dif you have different career paths out there, okay, then you, you'll find it, okay, not to pigeonhole yourself so early. 
You cannot say, oh, I just want to do design. Oh, I just want to do implementation. I just want to do healthcare. I just want to do schools. No. Okay, go out and find out for yourself. Do it, try it. Then you, then you will know. Okay, so I think that's the takeaway I can give to you. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, it's just like, um, I think it's probably also interesting for, for our students to kind of think about it because I think like, at architectural institution, we're somehow um, supporting this um, maybe misbelief too much that there's like kind of really the one perfect designer who's going to be in charge of it. Uh, while what you've been sharing about was kind of basically it's all about teamwork, many people actually working together, bringing different talents together, collaborating with other engineers, really kind of um, respecting their insights, like kind of listening to the clients. So it's actually a much more kind of uh, complex uh, settings that we maybe sometimes like kind of um, simulate at like kind of an architectural um, institution. But like kind of maybe as like kind of one last question, as one last question, because then I would actually like to hand over to the audience. Uh, do you think at architectural schools we should actually be more realistic, or should we just like kind of uh, support? go on and support the designer ego, what we kind of always do. Yeah. Good question and also politically inclined question. Um, I think for myself, um, I had the benefit of uh, studying in NUS, which is a very practical, Functional school, in a way. Sorry, anybody, any professor here? Um, uh, yeah, anyway, I'm also in NUS now, right, teaching. So, um, and then I also have the benefit of uh, going to the London um, to have a totally different experience where the school of the AA is, uh, I don't know. I don't know how to describe it. Um, it can be anything, right? In NUS, I was asked by my professor how many toilets you have, whether your structure is there, does it build, is it a building or is it a ground or surface? Um, I would just say my building is not a building. Um, and when I went to the AA, <coughs> it, the, the approach is very progressive. Um, you can choose not to do a building. My wife did one whole year of a uh, Derive intervention based on the situationist theory, and she just walked on the street, talking to people, drawing things on the street, graffitiing, and she passed her project. There's no building. Um, for me, my, my first year was all about opera, talking about art and performance. I did a huge year sculpture that I put on myself, and I walked around the city you know, behaving like a nerd. So, well, I think that's why I, I like challenges in this way, because I, I, I have to stimulate myself to think what is out of the box, right? I have to question myself. My, my tutor actually, you know, my, my fourth year tutor in the A when I first joined the school, I totally don't understand what he's talking about. And um, he was telling me that try to imagine that you are you think that you are in this world, but you're actually not in this world because your whole brain is encapsulated in the brain, in the skull. So you're actually not in this world. So I tried a long time, what is he, is he trying to tell me, you know? And they asked me to do drawings that I really don't know how to draw because, you know, in, in Singapore, I just draw a building. A line, a line is a building. A line that, uh, the four lines makes up a, a space and that's a building. But over there, the line is, is a tip, different kind of line. line it always has a meaning. It, 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 can, it can be a projection, it can be a movement, it can be a music. So that actually helps me to develop a totally different kind of experience. And um, so if you ask me, I think very importantly, you have to think about the process of your design, uh, not so much of what is the final product. Because at the end of the day, even if the project doesn't work, you know, you learn from it. And through this kind of experience, you actually become a better person. 
So a failed project doesn't mean it is a bad project. Yeah, a failed project can, if you, if you know where you fail, uh, you can still yeah, do very well in the future. I did very badly in the past before, so yeah, but you know, things are fine. So take it easy, enjoy yourself, enjoy your architecture, enjoy your design, and be passionate about it. Yeah. I echo the same view, okay? I think at this stage in university, I mentioned before, the uni won't teach you anything. Seriously, okay? You'll be very surprised when the time you get out, you say, what have I been spending the last few years doing? You know, it's, you're not prepared when you go out. But I think that is the whole point, okay? The uni is not trying to equip you with all the codes and laws and you know all the practicalities that is so evident outside you will learn that when you go out okay so take your time don't don't need to be bothered with all these things okay so what i mentioned earlier what does what you should be thinking of getting more you know, equipped with is to develop what you call design thinking okay to challenge okay design okay develop that Okay, because that is something, once you so-called, you know, have formed that sort of idea, ideas, it's very hard to change when you go out to work, when you go outside next time. So in school, you have all the freedom. You're only responsible to yourself. Okay, yeah, you know, you, you do badly, you get a bad grade. Yeah, so you deserved it, right? And if you put in a lot of effort, okay, you get a good grade. Yeah, you deserve it. Right, because you put in the effort. So you're only accountable to yourself. But when you go out to work, it's a very different scenario. You are accountable to the client, you know. You say you have a your deadlines, you know. So it's a very different ballgame. And you're normally not just doing it, the project yourself. You're working in a team. So it's not so much of, you know, imposing your own ego or your own wishes onto the team. No, it's never like that. It's always about teamwork. Okay, something that I'm sure you also learn to a certain extent in school. So whether or not the uni will be preparing you for the work outside, um, no. Okay, <laughs> I don't think that is the whole intention of a university degree. But maybe to balance that, okay, is really take the opportunity to go out for internship. Okay, have a do a year out. Okay, because I felt, at least for myself, um, the biggest transformation happened after I did my internship. I mean, like Lawrence, we're from the same cohort. Um, at that point in NUS, internship was mandatory. It was uh, at least a 10-month program. You must satisfy 10 months. Okay, but now they have scraped it. Okay, so I thought it was a big mistake because by going out to work, you realize, oh my God, you know, how naive you are. You know, what really matters is not what the school can teach you. And when you go back to school, you are very different. Okay, so the whole point is go outside, you know, see for yourself what can be done, what cannot be done, you know, slowly make up your mind. Okay? Maybe just to, just to add, for those of you who are looking forward to do an internship, I think the very important thing is that you should try to understand the practice that you want to join, what kind of uh, the architect he is, and uh, you, if you have a chance, speak to the person and understand his works and how he approached things and whether that is something that you, you like to do. Um, it's very important that you find a good mentor for your early part of your career. Um, I myself benefited from a lot of people who mentored me. Um, so it's very important to find somebody who has the time to teach you. And a lot of things are not just learned in this classroom. A lot of things can be learned in practice. And like what Jerry said, you know, it, it's very important. So don't be afraid of just, you know, don't, don't worry about, you know, if you're asked to do toilets, never mind, it's okay. Just draw for one year, it's okay. Then you really understand how toilet works, you know. I did that for a long time, draw toilets and over and over again. And I really know how to make a toilet very efficient. And that's what I did in SOM. Yeah, how to make an office building call efficient. Because office building is all about efficiency. Yeah, I, and I pride myself to, to gain another 0 0.3 meter square of leasable area. So that's where the satisfaction is. And nowadays, I also tell, tell the young guys, you know, don't be afraid if I just ask you to do toilet in the beginning. 
if you can't do a small thing properly, then you know, how can I give you a big building to do? So I think everybody start from simple, you know, simplicity is actually the most complicated thing to do. Yeah. All right. Oh, I love the energy on the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> you have no idea how complicated it is to design a good toilet until you start to do it yourself. Okay. I mean, it's, it's really, uh, you can imagine, for example, even in the hospital setting, right? How important, you know, to sterilize and get infection control, everything all con you know, properly done, you know? So from where is the dispenser to where is the tap, you know, where is the dryer, where is the paper tower, is a science, okay? That you think you know, you have got it all figured out, okay? Wait till you try it, okay? And uh, believe me, once you have done it, you will feel that there's a huge sense of achievement, although it's, it doesn't sound very right, isn't it? To say, oh, I feel I've achieved a lot by designing the perfect toilet. But it is. Okay, so I, I love that analogy because only by doing something so small, okay, that you start to you know, develop that design thinking and how this can translate into something much bigger. Okay, I think it would be invaluable. But please, Please don't become too pragmatic when you do an internship. We still want you to have crazy ideas afterwards, actually. Um, so we're running quite late, but I would still kind of give the audience um, the chance to ask uh, some questions. So if everybody would like to ask, the, the two microphones would actually be um, working. For Kendrick. Yeah. I was going to ask you. But no, I think I hear you. <laughs> okay, so going back to the big firm, large scale and big firm question. Um, has there ever been a moment? Okay, has there ever. <laughs> um, shh, maybe it's quite loud. Uh, has there. Looking at your trajectory through big firms and uh, RSP as well as CPG, right? Um, has it been a moment where you actually encountered an opportunity that you said, or like you thought to yourself that, luckily I'm in a big firm and not a small firm, or any situations that you wish that you were actually somewhere else? Like even looking at your peers from the same batch. <laughs> Is there anything that's unique about your big firm experience? I can, uh, maybe not quite like that, lah. <laughs> but I guess uh, at certain points, I think there are certain advantages, okay, when you're working in a big firm, because the type of projects you get are definitely going to be different from, say, what a small company might be doing. Okay, not to say whether there's any pro and cons between the two, but uh, it does expose you to different typologies, okay, and you get to work with different people. But I think we also, even as a big company, we do want to collaborate with also small companies. Okay, because there's always a lot of ideas that can bounce off you know, the two companies. I mean, actually we have been working with um, Got Kiang Forum and you know, uh, Yuan Hong before you know, in, on collaborations and things like that. I think there's a lot of room for collaborations even between small, medium and large companies. Okay, so it's not so much of like whether I feel I'm I, I want to be somewhere else. <laughs> not, not, not quite like that, okay? But uh, I think you, you, if you are busy enough, I don't think that question will arise, per se. Unless you're really unhappy with what you're doing, then, then you might be constantly thinking about it. I think in, in a large practice, you definitely get a lot more support. And uh, it is also a good place for young designers to actually uh, learn their skills. Uh, while, yeah, some people may say that, yeah, in a small practice, I also do everything and I get to learn everything. But to a certain extent, you are limited to certain type of projects in a small practice. Whereas uh, in a bigger practice, you get to be exposed to different and very varied kind of uh, works. Uh, even, you know, how, how do you help the client to, to bid for a land, for government land sales site? It can be a two week exercise. But in that two weeks exercise, you actually learn the whole spectrum of how to actually develop a piece of land. 
um, which is something that you know in a small practice you may not get to see and, and, and experience. Um, so whether lucky or not, I think each has its own um, pros and cons. Uh, in, a, in a bigger practice, you probably have to worry less about uh, whether you're getting a job or not because your bosses will be getting it for you, you know, in a way, then you can focus on your design. But of course, as you move up, you know, in different phases of your life, then you start to do different things. Um, you start to have different uh, criteria in your life. So um, it all depends on, on what you really want to do at the end of the day. Yeah. So um, some people, you know, some of my friends, they, they, they work halfway in a big practice and decide to start on their own. Uh, that's possible as well, you know. Um, so there's always an option yeah, to what you want to do. Maybe one last question. Anybody wants to go ahead? Okay, since you have already got a formal agenda of this lecture out already, so I want to leech on to some design thinking. Um, so, uh, Jerry, you mentioned about this bringing the community to your design in the hospital, and I thought that was quite interesting. In, uh, and I want to ask, um, how do you actually bring a uh, community into the design? Is it merely the placement of certain program activities that community can engage in, like rooftop garden, uh, rooftop farm, community farm, uh, uh, or is there any deeper uh, design thinking being put into it, or any empirical research that you can do to say, oh, this is actually a very feasible thing to do in our design? Yeah. So your question really is, how do you engage the community right, in your projects? Is that the question? Yeah. Right, um, okay. I guess uh, for it's, it's an idea okay, that we feel hospitals per se are not so-called stand-alone, closed-up facilities. Okay, that they, should be, they are meant for the public, okay, so they should be available and open to the public. Okay, so that is the ideology. And I think the idea is quite common now. Okay, people are accepting that hospitals are no longer a negative so-called building type biology per se. So if we just go back, say, um, to Changi General Hospital, I, I mean, my colleagues who work on the project, they shared with me that when the residents in Changi heard that a new hospital is going to be built just next door, Actually, they were very upset, okay, because they perceived then that hospitals are undesirable, you know, building typologies, you know, not in my backyard syndrome that you've heard of before. But after the project was completed, actually the property price went up in the, re in, you know, in the near vicinity because what happened was that it attracted a very different type of people who want to live next to the hospital. And from there, people start to realise, oh, is actually good to be located next to the hospital. Okay, so of course the factor here is my property price went up, right? So it's a very um, realistic type of concern. But in the case for other projects, I mean current projects that we're doing now, it's a very different mindset now. Okay, so for example, let me just give you an idea of Kodek Wat. Okay, so what happened is that we right from the start we know we wanted to be an open hospital. Okay, the CEO himself said we are the new kids on the block. We migrated from Alexandra to Yishun. We are new in Yishun. So the, the, the least they can do is not to be a nuisance. You know, before that, it was an empty field. And when the project is completed, I want the residents to feel that, oh my God, you know, it's even better than before. So that was that vision okay, that you should have you know, right from the start. Instead of saying, oh, how do I engage the community? But that is, that is the how. Okay? You must start questioning why you want to do it. Okay? So the hospital is for the community, so that's why you have to engage the community. And other things all happen by chance. For example, you mentioned the rooftop farm. So in Kudepot, what happened was that we have planned for rooftop gardens everywhere. You know, we, we wanted to create this large hospital, you know, create a healing environment. So what happened during the design phase was that the hospital heard that um, a, you know, this, in HDB, they have all these community farms. So one community farm, they have to give up their land because the HDB is taking back, well, no HDB reps here, but okay, um, they need to take back the land, so they are losing that 
place to plant their vegetables and fruits. So the hospital said, no, no problem. You come to my hospital. I'm offering you the rooftop on my clinics for you to do whatever you need to do. So that's what happened. So it happened by chance, but of course by design. We have designed that to be a garden in the first place. So we f the hospital facilitated that. And that's how we engage the community. And now they have ownership in the hospital. They don't, they feel like this is also my hospital, my land. And how it benefits the patients, the residents that, you know, I think a lot of us here have not seen how our food is grown. You know, so if you go there, you can see, oh my God, this is a, a rice plant, you know, this is a papaya tree. Oh, you know, so it's, it's also educational. You know, so it's a win-win, right? You know, the hospital win, the residents win. You know, and it's all started with the right mindset. Okay? I hope we answer your question. <laughs> not quite, not quite. <laughs> right, I guess maybe they are just supplement a bit more then. Okay, I mean, the, as a healthcare institute, okay, I mean, a hospital, a facility, you, you, there's a larger agenda at play here. Okay, um, it's not, a hospital should not be just a facility, okay, in my opinion, that treats and heal you. Okay, because it's really, uh, basically, let's say, when you come to the hospital, you already have a problem, right? So then the hospital repairs you. So the hospital is like a repair shop, per se, right? It has all the facilities, it has all the doctors that will treat and heal you. But I think the larger agenda the hospital should function, or what healthcare should be, is to spread the right message. You know, say, how do you maintain a healthy lifestyle so you don't fall sick in the first place? That is healthcare. Okay, healthcare is not about a repair. So then how does the hospital facilitate that? It's not, you realize it's not about the hardware anymore, isn't it? It's all about the software. So what it means is, how do you build in the programs within the hospital? So the urban farm is one. It's educational, it engages the community, okay, and there's a win-win situation. Then it extends down to say the food court. If you go to the food court in Kote Puat, Okay, basically, you try to change your behavior by offering you the cheaper option, okay, which is the healthier option. You know, normally you pay extra for brown rice. So they say, no, it's cheaper than to eat brown rice. Okay, then if drinks that have low sugar content are cheaper than drinks that have high sugar content. So it's trying to change your behavior by incentivizing you or de-incentivizing you to make the right choice. So that is the whole mindset that healthcare should be. Okay, so you realize it's not what really an architect should be doing, isn't it? You, you don't do that. You can't, unless you operate a food court, right? Okay, you can't do it. But you have to understand what the hospital is trying to do, and you facilitate that by making sure, okay, all the functions, all the facilities are well designed to make that happen for them. Okay, so, for example, you, how you design the gardens to be accessible, to be barrier-free, you know, so they engage us and make sure that everybody can make use of it. So, it's, you realize it's a balance, okay, there's a fine line between, you know, what an architect's job should be versus, you know, what the hospital is trying to do. It's never so clear. So, that's why I say it's always collaborative. So, communicate, communicate, communicate. Okay, understand. Okay, I remember as part of the design process for Kudepot, there was so many sessions and workshops whereby they brought in people from all groups. Okay, you have people who are visually disabled, you know, or hearing impaired, they're on wheelchair, they have all sorts of handicap. Okay, and then we engage them through all these different workshops. Then you start to understand what it really means to be in their shoes. Okay, and how that will translate to design. So again, you know, how, how that happens is again, communicate, communicate, communicate. There's no shortcut to any of this to see how you make that happen. Okay, so unfortunately, the bad news is that it takes time. Okay, it takes experience to learn that. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I mean, it's like... Uh 8.30 now, so we've been exceeding our time quite a lot, and our students are probably desperate to go back to the design studios, actually. <laughs> um, well, this was actually quite, quite insightful, and it was actually um, a pleasure to have you both around and kind of hear you listen to your arguments, like kind of, um, and kind of uh, answers to our, our questions. And it was actually quite, quite fascinating to, to compare 
uh, the architect that work actually in small firms uh, to the architect that work actually in large firms. And I have to say, you guys are not too different, right? You're just actually really still driven by your very personal and individual ambitions. And I think that's what we need all to actually proceed in this kind of very demanding uh, and complex uh, profession that we, at the end of the day, that we could still love our job and kind of uh, love to do so like kind of an even 10 or 20 years actually. Um, so let's raise our hands again and kind of say thank you to our guests and um, hope to see you for the next lecture again.